Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is The Black Prince, Part 2. Welcome back to The Black Prince's Story. This will cover him as a fully formed adult, planning his own battles, and putting what he's learned from his father to use. The Black Prince's next battle would almost be fun, if battles can be fun. In late 1349, the French, violating their own truce, started planning the retaking of Calais, led by Geoffrey de Charnay. 5,500 French troops marched to Calais on the 31st of December, 1349. The plan was perfect. The galley master had been bribed to allow the French forces in. They would quickly overrun the city, killing the garrison and restoring French honor. At least that was the plan. The galley master, it seems, double-crossed the French and informed, through intermediaries, Edward III. Edward III decided he and his son and 900 additional troops would deal with this themselves. Telling the galley master to take the bribe and allow the French in, they arrived in secret days before the planned attack. Edward III, the Black Prince, and their lieutenants secreted themselves near the gate that the French were to enter through. The fighting was fierce and brutal. At one point, the king and a few companions raced out of the castle, fighting off French soldiers, only to be cut off from return. The Black Prince quickly came to his father's aid, protecting him from capture or death. The English were victorious and took many prisoners. Edward III was unusually cruel to his highest-ranked prisoner. De Charnay was mocked publicly for a lack of chivalry in attacking the city while under truce. De Charnay would remain a hostage for the next year. His release was delayed by a change in French leadership. In August of 1350, Philip the Fortunate died at 57. Philip VI was succeeded by his son, John II, the Good. Though, that super K is an interesting choice, as we'll see. Here I need to introduce a, a very minor character into our story. Just, you can probably forget about him. John of Gaunt. You all knew he was coming, so don't act surprised. <laughs> the third surviving son of Edward III. In August of 1350, he was 10 years old and about to join the person he near worshipped on a sea adventure. I do think it's funny to think of one of the greatest military and political men of his day as a 10-year-old boy joining his big brother on a naval campaign. He will be getting three episodes of his own, so you'll hear more about him soon. The Black Prince and John would be on a ship together in an armada with their father. The King of Castile had formed an alliance with France, and their combined Castilian Genoese fleet had been disrupting English shipping in early 1350. Edward III, not surprisingly, was unimpressed and decided to do something about it. On the 28th of August, 1350, Edward set out with 50 ships and the requisite men. A day later, they engaged with the 47-ship Spanish fleet. It was a rout. The English took at least 14 ships and possibly as many as 26. There were multiple Spanish ships sunk, but only two English ships were sunk. In an unfortunate moment, though, one of those ships was the one containing the Black Prince and his brother. Luckily for them, their cousin, Henry of Lancaster, saw their ship floundering against the Spanish ship they were grappling and came to their rescue, attacking the same ship from the opposite side. The Spanish ship was taken, and the Black Prince, his brother, and their men rushed onto the Spanish ship right before theirs sank. A year later, Henry of Lancaster would be made the second duke in England as the first duke of Lancaster. The Black Death was in remission in 1350. Many pandemics followed this pattern of waxing and waning, and when travel was slower, it took longer for these outbreaks to come back. The plague, as it's also known, arrived in England in 1348, likely carried back by troops from Edward III and the Black Prince's campaign. It would have reached England at some point regardless of troop movements. There was bustling trade between England and the continent after all. I'll be doing a special episode about the plague because it really is a subject onto itself. I don't want to focus on it too much in this episode, but I need to give it a moment. It's here, 
impacting populations, killing members of society, regardless of age, social class, or wealth, and devastating all it touches. It will even kill one of the Black Prince's sisters, Joan, who was only 14. She had ignored warnings to avoid a plague town on her journey to Castile. In England, estimates vary, but between 30 and 60% of the population had died. Think of how big of an impact the current pandemic is having, and its mortality rate is minuscule compared to the plague. Much like now, employees had a lot more power than they'd had previously. They could demand higher wages, and many would leave their land to look for better paid work. There were legislative attempts to stop this, putting caps on wages and trying to force peasant farmers to stay on their land. For the Black Prince, this would not only hurt personally, but also financially. Money is always something kings and princes need to worry about. They need to appear generous while also maintaining reserves to hire troops or pay for arms. The Black Prince had taken over most of his own finances, so he needed to be aware of where his money was going. In the years following the outbreak, his rent receipts were down as much as 95%, and he personally forgave the rents of his tenants who would leave his properties otherwise. He asked his agents to deal fairly with tenants in cases of disputed payments. As Earl of Cheshire, he was in charge of governing the region, not just receiving rents. In the summer of 1353, the citizens of this county expressed their frustration with his chosen representatives by killing one of his bailiffs who was on official business. To bring order back to this area, the Black Prince visited in person with multiple officers in June of that year. For protection, he brought his cousin, Henry of Lancaster, and Henry's retinue. Two senior earls were positioned within a short ride. In his meeting with county leadership, he agreed to extend some of their privileges, while they agreed to pay a fine of £3,300 over the next four years. Money was an ongoing issue for the Black Prince. Even when he earned a lot from his chevauchee and hostages, he spent a lot on campaigns and gifts. In early 1355, the 24-year-old, yes, 24-year-old, Black Prince met with one of his fellow Order of the Garter members, Jean de Grailly, who was a knight in Gascony. De Grailly had come to London for a tournament to celebrate the birth of the Black Prince's youngest sibling, Thomas of Woodstock. In addition to getting his melee and joust on, de Grailly wanted to speak with Edward III and the Black Prince with regard to Gascony. De Grailly and the other Gascon nobles were struggling with the Count of Armagnac, John. The Count of Armagnac was the governor of Languedoc, a province on the east side of Gascony. With John II's consent, he had been invading and capturing Gascon cities and trying to win Gascon nobles to the French cause. De Grailly suggested to Edward III that he send one of his sons to govern Gascony. It's obvious which son he was suggesting. Of Edward's sons, only the Black Prince was old enough and experienced enough. While Edward III had faith in his son, he did consider sending a more experienced leader. He took the proposal to council, and in late May 1355, it was decided that the Black Prince would be appointed lieutenant of Gascony. This was part of Edward III's broader plan of restarting war with France. Edward III and the young French king, John II, had been attempting to negotiate a new treaty. While his subjects in England may have taken Edward III's claims to the French throne seriously, history shows it was often a bit of political expediency. He was willing to sign it away if it would get him something good that he didn't have to fight for. In this case, he was willing to trade it for Aquitaine, not just Gascony, and the right to hold it as an independent duchy, not as a vassal to the French crown. King John II would probably regret turning this offer down in the next few years. Since treaty negotiations had stalled and the earlier truce had expired, Edward III decided it was time to send his son back to the continent. On the 10th of July, 1355, the Black Prince was fully invested as the Lieutenant of Gascony. The Black Prince would take 2,600 soldiers with him, evenly divided between archers and men-at-arms. Four earls, along with two lords and two knights, were assigned as his special advisors. The rest of his knights were all members of the Order of the Garter. One of these knights, Sir John Chandos, is to thank for the Chandos Herald, one of the primary sources for this time period. 
Due to bad wind, life is hard without combustion engines or even boats that could tack easily. The Black Prince wouldn't reach Bordeaux, the capital of Gascony, until the 16th of September, 1355. On the 21st, he swore an oath in the local cathedral to maintain the local customs and privileges and to be a good lord. The local leaders then in kind swore oaths of fidelity to the Black Prince. The local elite were grateful for the Black Prince's leadership. They were hoping he would start a campaign against the Count of Armagnac, and they were not disappointed. After the oaths had been sworn, the Black Prince went into the local square to speak to the citizens of Bordeaux. He told them he shared their hatred for Armagnac and would respond to his assaults on Gascony with his army. In addition to the troops the Black Prince had brought, 2,400 Gascons joined his ranks, bringing his army up to 5,000, all on horseback. The Black Prince's plan was to cheveche through the lands of the Count of Armagnac. The Black Prince and his forces began their march in early October 1355. Armagnac, the county, not the count, was part of Gascony, and therefore part of the Black Prince's land. While what follows is cruel to modern ears, it was what would have been expected. A rebelling count should expect to be punished by his lord, or prince, or king. His lord, or prince, or king would not remain such if he could not stop a recalcitrant vassal. The Black Prince and his army reached the edge of lands firmly under his control on the 4th of October. Raiding and looting as they went, on the 23rd, the army reached the Count's personal estates. His fortress was burnt to the ground, and the lands and town around it were sacked. The Count of Armagnac locked himself and his soldiers in Toulouse to avoid battle. I'm sure he would tell you he was playing the Fabian strategy, but it seems likely he was playing the hide and pray strategy. He stated to his peers that his soldiers were of poor quality as compared to the Black Prince's troops. I do hope he said this when his soldiers weren't around. Over a total of eight weeks, the Black Prince and his forces continued to ravage the countryside, attacking the city of Carcassonne, avoiding its citadel due to its heavy guard. No word on what happened to its meeple. After reaching Narbonne on the Mediterranean coast, they turned back to return to Gascony. While the Black Prince was on his chevauchee, his father had sailed to Calais and attempted to offer battle to John II, which was refused. While he was avoiding Edward III, John II was somehow displeased with the lack of action from his leaders in Armagnac. The Viscount of Norbonne was so shamed, he marched out to attempt battle against the Black Prince. The Black Prince returned to Gascony on the 28th of November. He had marched from the Atlantic coast of France to the Mediterranean and back with almost no resistance. After returning to Bordeaux, the Black Prince disbanded a portion of his army. The rest he set up in winter quarters. He would spend Christmas, New Year's, and the early part of 1356 in Bordeaux. The next bit of action his troops saw would be terrifying and exhilarating. The Black Prince didn't just rest idly through this time. He and his father were planning a great joint campaign with their cousin, Henry of Lancaster. John II had shown himself unable to motivate his nobles. He appeared weak. 1356 seemed the perfect year to strike. Edward III's other cousin, Charles II of Navarre, the Bad, son of Joan II of Navarre from last season, and Philip the Wise, was doing what he did best, causing chaos. He stoked the fires of rebellion, and descent in Normandy, where he was a great landholder. In April of 1356, he had been attending a dinner party with the Dauphin, Charles, the future Charles V. It was interrupted by John II, who arrested Charles. Charles got off pretty unburnt. Four other guests, all of noble birth, were executed. This did not help John II's popularity. Edward III knew this was the time to strike. His goal was to lure John into battle. Edward III would land in Calais and march from there. Henry of Lancaster would march from the west near saint vaast la roche and the Black Prince would march up from Gascony. Have a look at a map if you can. If the plan was to attack near Rouen, it would mean a 200 plus kilometer march for Edward, a 240 kilometer march for Henry of Lancaster, and a 570 plus kilometer march for the Black Prince. Remember, communication lines over this time were pretty much non-existent, 
and there would be multiple river crossings for each army. This was an ambitious plan from the start. The Black Prince left Bordeaux on the 25th of June, 1356, marching towards Bergerac, where he was delayed for four weeks due to the Count of Armagnac deciding his Fabian tactics had failed and attacking Gascony. The Black Prince was forced to divide his troops, sending 2,000 with his Senchel to defend Gascony. During this delay, Henry of Lancaster had been forced to change plans due to his route to France being blocked. Instead of landing at saint vaast la roche he was forced to disband some of his troops before heading to Brittany. Edward III was also held up in England. The mouth of the Seine was blocked by John's Argonese allies, but the Black Prince knew nothing of this. He set off from Bergerac on the 8th of August with approximately 6,000 men, including 2,000 longbowmen. Upon reaching Verzon on the 28th of August, he realized his father and cousin were not nearby. He sent two of his lieutenants ahead to scout. They came back with news that not only had Edward III not landed, but King John had gathered a massive army and was heading towards their location. They were unable to get word about Henry of Lancaster. Now, when I say King John II had gathered a massive army, I'm not understating it. When combining his forces with the Count of Poitiers, who was joining him from the east, he would have at least 14,000 men, including all four of his sons and 350 of his nobles. Edward III was aware of what was happening on the continent and was desperate to get to his son. It's one thing to stick your son on the front line when you're there and he's 16. It's a completely different thing to leave him outnumbered in enemy territory, right? Sadly for him, the Argonese fleet appeared in Kent right at this moment. He had managed to send an order to Henry of Lancaster to leave Brittany and go assist the Black Prince. At the moment, the Black Prince realized something was wrong and turned around for Gascony. John II's troops were only 153 kilometers to his north, and the Count of Poitiers was 105 kilometers to the east. Henry of Lancaster was 435 kilometers to the west, and the Black Prince had 450 kilometers to march before he'd reach the safety of Gascony. Hoping his cousin could reach him in time, he began marching west quickly. Henry of Lancaster had saved his life once at the Battle of Winchelsea. Perhaps he would be able to do so again. He was known for his speed on campaign. The Black Prince reached Tours on the Loire River on the 7th of September. Henry of Lancaster was only 112 kilometers away from him at this point. Lancaster had covered more than 200 kilometers in only four days. For reference, it took the Black Prince nine days to cover approximately 120 kilometers, and he wasn't traveling slowly. 13 kilometers per day is a very reasonable rate for troops who had been traveling for over a month. The Black Prince and his army crossed the Loire, don't want to be stuck on the wrong side of the river, hoping to meet with Henry downstream. However, the weather did not play nice. After weeks of sun and mild weather, it rained for three days straight filling the Loire and blocking Henry of Lancaster's crossing options. The two armies could see each other from across the river, but Henry would be unable to come to his cousin's assistance. I can only imagine how deflated he would have felt. While the Black Prince was trying to link up with his cousin, John II was marching after him. He was able to cross the Loire at a well-defended bridge he had left standing. He ordered the Count of Armagnac to march north, with the goal of cutting off the Black Prince's retreat to Gascony. At this moment, a little luck came to the Black Prince. Luck is not something to laugh at. Even Napoleon, when offered two equally qualified officers and only one promotion spot, would select the one who had a history of good fortune. Pope Innocent had sent his papal legate, Cardinal Talleyrand, to attempt to negotiate between the Black Prince and John II. While it wouldn't seem lucky to be stopped, the Cardinal brought some interesting papers to the Black Prince. These letters were from his father, written on the 4th of August, authorizing the Black Prince to negotiate on Edward III's behalf. It was the clearest sign that he was on his own. How was this lucky? Because the Black Prince, it turns out, was really good at fighting when outnumbered and having nothing to lose. Negotiations were delayed and the Black Prince continued to march south. He found out his retreat was blocked. 
on the 18th of September, just outside of Poitiers. He selected the location for battle. Cardinal Talleyrand made one more appearance to attempt negotiations for a truce. King John, confident of winning, demanded the English give up all their gains and release their French prisoners without ransom. He also requested a seven-year truce. The Black Prince, seeing that this was the time to throw out random wishes, asked for one of the king's daughters in marriage, those hostages who live with their captors, and a huge dowry. No one was accepting of any terms. In shocking news for both the Black Prince and Talleyrand, some of the cardinal's retinue joined the French side. Very uncool, guys. The next morning, the 19th of September, 1356, the English started the day by feigning a retreat, provoking the French to battle. The English were on higher ground, much like Cressy, with trees to the right flank and rear. The Black Prince had set his archers up in a protected position on the left of the field. There were three French charges. While the English were able to fight these off, each French attack was a different division. The French were losing men, but still had plenty in reserve. Before the fourth attack, John II's sons, at least three of them, possibly all four, left the field. The fourth did come back, though. The French aura flame was displayed. This flag indicates that no quarter is to be given, so a surrendering fighter will be killed. One of the Black Prince's injured lieutenants led a flanking maneuver while the main host advanced upon the French. The French forces attacked from both the front and rear, lost formation. The battle ended with the capture of King John II and his youngest and now favorite son, Philip. Young Philip, the future Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, who was only 14, had stood by his father's side at the end of battle. The Black Prince had only lost 40 knights. The French had lost over 4,000. The English Gascon army returned to Gascony. They reached a border city on the 2nd of October and triumphantly marched into Bordeaux two weeks later. The Black Prince would return to England the following year with his prisoners. A treaty wouldn't be signed until 1360. When it was signed, it gave Edward III a great deal of French territory held without doing homage, meaning they were his and not French. In exchange, Edward III renounced his claim to the French throne. Over the next few years, the Black Prince spent time in England, partook in another campaign, this time in Reims, and then finally, on the 10th of October, 1361, he got married. He was 31, his bride was 33, and this was a love match. Joan, Countess of Kent, was Edward III's first cousin, through his uncle Edmund of Woodstock, 1st Earl of Kent. That would be the uncle whom Roger Mortimer executed in 1330. Edward III had been very kind to his young cousin. She had been married previously, twice actually, but only once legally, and was the mother of three young children. There are suggestions that the Black Prince and Joan proceeded with their engagement without the king's consent. They would need papal dispensation, so eventually everyone would find out that this was happening. They would have two sons, one surprisingly named Edward, in July of 1364, and Richard, the future Richard II, in 1367. Edward of Angoulême would die in January 1371. By all accounts, the family were very close, and the Black Prince and Joan were a loving and happy couple. In July of 1362, Edward III granted the Black Prince Aquitaine, not just as lieutenant, but as a prince vassal. The Black Prince would be expected to keep the duchy peaceful. His biggest challenge would be the Free Companies, groups of formerly disbanded soldiers who had taken to banditry in the French countryside. While they weren't usually attacking Gascony, Edward III did ask his son to try to discourage their behavior. In April of 1364, John II of France died at 44. He was succeeded by his son, Charles V. Charles had no martial bravery. He was bookish, thoughtful, and intelligent. This is what would help him the most, as we'll see through the Black Prince's Brothers episodes. He would earn the sobriquet the wise, a well-applied appellation. In 1366, King Peter of Castile was ejected from his kingdom by his bastard, literally, half-brother Henry. Henry of Trastamara 
had been assisted by the free companies acting as mercenaries. Peter sent word while he was fleeing, asking for his ally, England's assistance. The Black Prince was in the best position to do so, but originally didn't support Peter on ideological grounds. Peter was known as the Cruel. He had killed his loyal half-brother, Henry's twin, out of paranoia. He had locked up his first wife and had her murdered. Edward III overruled his son and convinced him and his brother John that this was a worthy cause. Since this campaign has a lot more to do with John of Gaunt's future, I'll leave it for his episode. Plus, Charles II of Navarre's behavior will be covered in his special episode. I know you're all stoked for that episode. It will be lit. What's important to know is that A, the Black Prince won because he never lost. B, it was a financially pyrrhic victory because, surprise, Peter of Castile didn't pay him their agreed upon fees. And C, this was the first time the Black Prince got really ill, likely from dysentery, which raced through his army. Upon his return to Gascony, the Black Prince was broke. He had funded the entire Castilian campaign, and over the next few years, he would lose multiple friends in small skirmishes and battles. His last battle would be the one I mentioned in his introduction, the Siege of Limoges. There's something I didn't mention in the introduction, though. He was brought to the siege on a stretcher. He was so unwell, he was unable to ride a horse. In early 1371, Right after the death of his oldest son, the Black Prince resigned his command of Gascony and returned to England. His health was declining, and he likely hoped the reduced stress in England would help him. Over the next few years, he took an active part in English politics and tried to check some of John's more revolutionary tendencies. But his health never recovered. While many have stated he died of dysentery, I don't know how accurate that is. Yes, his first illness in 1366 was likely dysentery, but the immune system normally fights it off within two weeks, or the patient dies. There is a chance that he was reinfected, but I can find no evidence of an outbreak in England around the time of his final illness in 1376. If I could make an educated laywoman's guess, I would suggest that the first bout of dysentery injured his intestinal barrier and caused a change in his microbiome, precipitating inflammatory bowel disease. This could have led to colon cancer. It has symptoms that match the Black Prince's symptoms better for his final illness. If I have any doctors listening, please let me know what you think. I did discuss this with a doctor, but I'm sure a gastroenterologist would have their own thoughts. With the Black Prince's death on the 8th of June, 1376, England and her French territories would have been left in a state of shock. There had only been two other minorities in Anglo-Norman history, those of Henry III and Edward III. Henry's rule was an unmitigated disaster, and had Edward III not overthrown his regents, his might have been as well. I'll be covering the Black Prince's son's reign throughout his brother's episodes, but it took a bit more after Henry III's than Edward III's. The Black Prince wasn't a perfect leader or person. To modern eyes, he would seem brutal in his military strategies, But in his time, he was considered a great leader. Capturing the French king was one of the high points of the Hundred Years' War. Only Henry V's victory at Agincourt would ever compare. Would the Black Prince have been a better king than the person who took his place? Yes. Hands down. An experienced 46-year-old brilliant military leader is so much better than a 10-year-old boy (laughs) led by a council with some uncle issues. Had the Black Prince ruled for even 10 years, Richard's mental health issues would likely have been noticed and addressed by possibly removing him from the succession or setting up a lifetime regency council. Had the Black Prince ruled for 15 years, dying at near the same age as his father, he would have been powerful enough to make the decision of who should rule after him. He is likely the best king England never had. I have a long list of heir apparents who died before the monarch, and there are only three I rate as highly as Edward the Black Prince, in being not just a better option than the king who replaced them, but a better option than the king they should have succeeded. For the curious, those would be Germanicus, heir to his uncle Tiberius, and father to Caligula, Henry V, heir to his father-in-law, Charles VI of France, and Henry Frederick, 
heir to his father, James I and VI. The first two were greater military and political minds than their predecessors or sons. The third was a thoughtful, intelligent young man, dedicated to the religion of England with the charisma his father and younger brother both lacked. Luckily for you, I don't just do episodes on competent pasts. That would be a really short series. It's hard to imagine the pain that was felt in England and France when the Black Prince died. Even those he fought mourned him. Next week, I will be discussing the forgotten second surviving son of Edward III. Yeah, it's not John of Gaunt, guys. It's Lionel of Antwerp. In this episode, I will also include discussion on Edward III's will and how this would impact the War of the Roses and Richard II's decisions on who his heir should be. Please join me for that. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.